Good evening and a very warm welcome to the July meeting of Nottingham Astronomical Society. Tonight's lecture is on Mars in 2020 and we're delighted to welcome Dr Richard McKim for tonight's talk. A quick plug uh, for our next meeting before we begin tonight. And it promises to be a really special meeting for the Society as we welcome back one of our past presidents of Nottingham Astronomical Society, Alan Heath. Alan was elected president of our society way back in 1958 and his talk will be on his lifetime of astronomical observations. Alan has a wealth of experience uh, and knowledge in astronomy and he'll be sharing with us some of his observations through the decades of the planets and also his very long observations of sunspots. So do join us on what should be a really special meeting on Thursday the 16th of July at 8pm. Tonight's meeting we focus on probably one of the most intriguing planets in our solar system, Mars. More robotic missions have been sent to the planet Mars than all of the other planets combined. And we're really pleased Dr Richard McKim, who is the British Astronomical Association Mars Section Director, has accepted our invitation to deliver tonight's talk on Mars ahead of the autumn apparition of the planet. A little bit about Richard. Richard is also the archivist and a trustee of the BAA. He served as the association's president between 1993 and 95. Richard records his astronomical observations by sketching and he captures astonishing detail through his 41 centimetre Dolkirkham Cassegrain telescope, which he built himself. So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight Dr Richard McKim and his talk on Mars in 2020. Well, good evening, Nottingham Astronomical Society, and welcome to Mars and the Amateur Astronomer. I'm Richard Kim. I've been the director of the Mars section of the BAA for a long time now, and I'm going to share some of my experiences with you this evening. You'll see some spacecraft pictures and some spacecraft themselves, but I'm not here mostly to talk about that. I'm going to talk mostly about what the amateur can do what the amateur can see with his or her telescope. And right in the middle of that slide, Mars, one of the best views I ever had um, back in 1986, another perihelic opposition. Anyway, let's make a start. I'd like to say hello this evening, if he's welcome, if, if he's watching rather, to my old friend Alan Heath, who was one of my first friends in the BAA back in 1975. And it was Alan's influence as much as anyone else that I um, became very interested in planetary observation. There's some lovely drawings by Alan with his 12-inch reflector, Long Eaton, of Mars in 1978, uh, which seems now quite a long time ago. So hello to Alan if you're watching this at any point in the future. When I was growing up as a child in the 1960s, the solar system seemed, at the time, a more interesting place than it does now. This is a picture from one of my childhood books, Timothy's Space Book. And here's a lovely picture of Mars with its canals. It looks like almost a series of paddy fields there. And I wondered perhaps at the time as a child how they knew uh, that those uh, canals and those waterways were quite so geometric and what they might have grown in those fields. I was very excited that vegetation seems to grow there, a very positive statement. But we do not think there are any animals. The air is too thin. Well, that was exciting. It wasn't the only book that I had. And I come now perhaps to one of the, um, the key points where I realized I was really interested in Mars. And this is the picture that got me hooked, really. Here it is. And it's from another childhood book, which shows a very interesting looking dog. And as a child, I think I was less interested in the spacecraft, but I wanted to meet that particular dog. Uh, and I didn't know how they had um, pictures of dogs like that on Mars. Well, perhaps that's for the future. But again, uh, the interesting comment that vegetation appears to grow there, like crops do on the Earth. One day, man will land there and find out. Well, I think in the 60s, uh, we all assumed that by the 80s, man would have landed there. Unfortunately, the date of the manned mission seems to be receding at the rate of one year per year. And I'm wondering whether in, even in my lifetime, we shall ever actually get there. But at the moment, we have to make do with robots. 
Let's have a look at Mars in the solar system. It's a relatively small world. There's the Earth, the Moon, the scale. And the fact that it's going to be smaller than the Earth means that it has weaker gravity and is less able to retain the heavier atmosphere, the lighter atmospheric gases in its atmosphere. So we've got an atmosphere mostly consisting of carbon dioxide, and even that at fairly low pressure. And of course, Mars is further from the Sun than the Earth. So it turns out that water can either be in the solid state, over ice caps, or subsurface ice, or in the form of water vapor in the atmosphere, but not liquid water on the surface. We've had a number of robotic vehicles, of which this was one of the most um, complicated, that have roved about the surface of the Mars, uh, explored, of course, only a tiny fraction of the surface, and that um, rather slowly over a period of some years. Some of them have gone spectacularly beyond their design lifetimes. Um, one of the problems they've had has been the physical decomposition of those large um, tires. And another problem that they do have are the solar cells, which often get covered with dust. Uh, and this was um, certainly the cause of the demise of one of the recent spacecraft in 2018 during the course of the global dust storm. Here's Nice picture showing a sunset on Mars. This would be what it would look like if it were actually on the surface. The far distance uh, is comparatively close because the, the planet's surface is more curved than the Earth. And we see this reddish color which pervades everything. It's a reddish, dusty deposit over which the planet is covered. It's been bombarded by meteorites, of course, over uh, millennia. So all of the rocks have been crumbled to a fine powder, fine dust at the order of one micron in size, that's a um, millionth of a meter. So we see uh, interesting sunset colors, interesting sunset effects, and we see a pinkish sky. We see this red color. So it's silicate dust, weathering product, rocks, but formed with a lot of iron oxide, ferric oxide, better known on the earth as rust. There have been some exciting discoveries in recent years. Um, the story of the gullies broke in the press some years ago. This was one of the many occasions when NASA discovered water on the surface or thought they might have discovered water. Um, these gullies now, uh, we thought at the time they were due to uh, running water or solutions of salts just below the surface. Uh, we now know they're much more likely to be due to hygroscopic minerals which darken at certain times of the year as they absorb atmospheric water vapor. So, so near and yet so far. So we haven't got running streams on Mars. It's a great pity, but we just simply haven't. We've also got some of the most spectacular scenery you could possibly imagine anywhere in the solar system. This is part of the Valles Marineris, the Martian Grand Canyon, which would dwarf its neighbor in Arizona. We've got those lovely white clouds nestling down there. This is a feature you can actually see uh, from the Earth, and at times of dust storms, you can sometimes see the valley filled with billowing yellow clouds, and I'll show you some pictures of that later on. But what a fantastic view that would be to stand on the edge. It would certainly be a long way down. But as I said at the beginning, I'm mostly here to talk to you about what Mars looks like in a telescope. Uh, this uh, drawing here is not by me, it's by a well-known artist who ne whose name I will leave as an exercise for the listener. And at the bottom, a drawing of my own, and my old friend uh, Mario Frassati um, copied that drawing onto the eyeball to show a sort of reflection in an observer's eye looking through a powerful telescope. Sometimes when we look at old drawings of Mars, we think the observer couldn't possibly have seen what they saw. And a lot of people who looked at Cassini's drawings from 1666, who's actually a very, very good observer, um, Cassini, um, who discovered the division between Saturn's A and B rings, people would have said, oh, that's just symmetrical white spots. It's a bad telescope, a small telescope, something like a three inch refractor. But I'd like you to compare it with the drawing of my own from 1995, a apelic opposition at which the North Polar cap at the bottom is, is quite large. And if we look at Cassini's drawing, at the top, we've probably got Hellas, which is covered with, with frost, the Hellas Basin. 
on the right hand side we've got a morning cloud over Chrysi, and on the evening side we've got an afternoon cloud over Isidus Regio, Libya, and at the bottom we've got the North Polar Cap. So it's very likely that Cassini was observing the same longitude of Mars and it is shown all of these features. Christian Huygens, one of the first people to sketch a recognizable feature on the planet, 1656, there's his drawing of the Certus Major. And there's a drawing from 1956 by my old friend Odouan Dolphus uh, from the Peak du Midi showing the Certus Major. And it's obvious what marking Huygens was seeing. So these old drawings have a wealth of information that can be still utilized by the modern observer and historian. Uh, however, Mars has got a rather bad press when it comes uh, to uh, certain observers, and Giovanni Schiaparelli was certainly uh, responsible for some of that. And here's a chart of Mars he made from his observations from the Brera Observatory in Milan in the 1870s and 80s. And he tended to, uh, in a way, to join the dots. His eye, his brain did some of the work that the eye uh, could not do, and joined up um, what must have been a underlying pattern of rather rough um, spots and irregularities and half tones to make these so-called Martian canals or canali as he called them. These of course are illusory and they gave a lot of bad press in the early days to Mars and to planetary observation in general. But uh, it's a fact of history that they're there and we're stuck with them. At the same opposition of 1877 another um, observer, an Englishman this time, Nathaniel Green, who was at one time watercolorist um, and instructor to Queen Victoria and to her daughters at one point. He also turned his attention to Mars in 1877. There's his telescope there set up on the island of Madeira, where he made the first map of Mars, and there it is. And some lovely drawings that he made using pastels and watercolors. And Scaparelli and Green made some of the first maps of Mars. Green's was the work of an artist, um, and Schiaparelli's the work of uh, perhaps a mathematically minded astronomer. Here are some original drawings from the archives of the RAS, and they show the beautiful original drawings of the planet. Had he decided to have his holiday on Madeira um, two months earlier, he would have seen nothing of the planet's surface because it was recovering from a global dust storm. So lucky for history that he chose his holidays in September. Another very famous observer who used a large telescope, who some of you will have heard of because of his scale of seeing, Eugène Antoniadi. There he is there, uh, pictured in 1907 at the top and 1893 at the bottom, and his telescope, the great 33-inch refractor of the observatory of Madon. Here are some drawings of the 1909 opposition and showing the beginning, the features extremely faint, the planet covered with a yellow lemon mist or fog, as he called it at the time, which later turned out to be one of the best documented global dust storms. And then we see the features recovering later on. And here's a close up of that dome. It's a telescope that I know very well myself because I used to use it in the 1980s. And it was a fantastic instrument um, to use, and I just wish I had handwriting as a school teacher as neat as Antoniati's. Here's a picture of the telescope um, as uh, I last used it in 1988, and I'm standing there in the dome speaking to Odouin Dolphus, who was in charge of it, who was the chief astronomer of the Paris Observatory. And the modern telescope has a rising floor, a nice instrument to observe with, but it didn't always have that. Um, the one that I'm showing here is from 1924, when it had just a little sector of floor. And I remembered when I saw this photograph that my old friend Patrick Moore used to observe the moon from Murdon, and even in his early days, Patrick was quite a heavy character. And I remember pointing this out to Odouan Dolphus, who had observed with him, and Odouan claimed that he was throwing his weight over the other side of the platform to counteract and prevent any possible uh, mishap with the platform. But that's a nice little historical story. A nice telescope to observe with, but of course we have to make do with less. Minimum size that you might use would be something like a, a six inch aperture, 15 centimeter, but at a perihelic opposition like the 2021, you'll be able to see quite a bit with even quite a small telescope.
I wanted to share with you this lovely um, drawing that Antoniadi made. It's actually a watercolor of the planet. And uh, he had great skill in observing color and position. It's a really very accurate um, drawing of the feature as it appeared at the time. And you'll notice there are no canals. Uh, one of his great achievements was to show that canals uh, didn't exist. And maybe this is a good moment to say a few words about how you might do a drawing at the telescope. If you're a member of the BAA, you might have seen a web tutorial that I published in the last few days, which you can link from the front page, tutorial on planetary sketching. And that contains quite a lot of tips. But I would just say that one of the biggest problems that observers have when they're looking at Mars, they've got a small image in the telescope. And the problem is to transfer that small image to um, two inch or 50 millimeter um, diameter observing blank and to get the proportions right. Uh, it's quite usual, for example, to draw the polar cap uh, too small or to make all sorts of other drawing errors. And what I like to do when I'm looking through the eyepiece is to divide the, um, the vertical dimension, the north-south axis of the planet, into tenths, and the same with the east-west diameter. And then I might say that a feature is so many tenths um, beneath the, um, the centre of the disk or so many tenths to the left. And then when I'm faced with my sketch, I can make the same proportions on that sketch and, and try to get in the main features accurately. Once I've done that and noted the time, I can take my time with the fine detail. So if you mentally um, divide the planet's disk in that way, uh, it'll be a good way to start learning to sketch. Another thing I would say to you as a planetary observer, uh, you don't have to, uh, to practice at night. Uh, a brilliant thing to do is to observe sunspots, if there were any sunspots at the moment, by projection and to, to draw those or to draw um, a friend's portrait from a photograph. There are many things you can do to improve your um, artistic um, uh, temperament. The other thing you'll see about this uh, drawing, of course, is it's in colour. Uh, doing things in colour is a little bit tricky. I wouldn't recommend using crayons or coloured pencils because you tend to make uh, mistakes that you can't rub out. What I would recommend you to do is to do technique using pastels. I won't say any more about it now. I'll just refer you to the BAA website front page and my tutorial on planetary sketching. And if you want to follow that up, then um, all the detail, the tips are there for you. Here are some drawings I made. And I should just say at once that the letter Y does not actually exist on the surface of Mars. Uh, what I've done with those few drawings that show it, Y stands for yellow cloud or dust obscuration. So you can see it on the top line there, 2001. There was a global storm developing. You can also see it on one of the drawings from 2005 when there was dust along the Vallis Marineris, which is the lower of the two Ys on that drawing there. And I put in this drawing, this set of drawings, to show you how the Martian seasons uh, develop, as it were, from year to year. So uh, 2001, we're seeing uh, spring and summer in the southern hemisphere. 2003, the drawings show mostly summer. And then 2005, we're moving into autumn. And then 2007, 2010, we're seeing spring and summer in the northern hemisphere of the planet. And you can see that the polar caps follow seasonal cycles just as they do on the Earth. And of course, as they um, sublime into the atmosphere of Mars during the course of the spring and summer in the appropriate hemispheres, they release volatiles into the atmosphere, which we can see in the form of Martian clouds. And these are fascinating to follow. It's very interesting to, to see whether these uh, Martian clouds appear on time, as it were, from year to year, whether Mars is following its own calendar or not. Let's have a look at some other observations. And what I've done here is to just show you a little bit about how people's style um, develops over the years. These are all perihelic oppositions, oppositions when Mars was particularly close to the sun and therefore to, to, to the Earth and to the sun when it was at opposition. Mars, of course, has a rather, a rather elliptical orbit, which I'll show you in a few moments' time. But have a look now um, at the differences in style. You can see in the drawing from 1954, for example, that the observer is still showing hints of the canals on the surface, but the observers from 1986 onwards 
um, don't draw canals on the planet's surface, perhaps because they know they're not there. But there's some interesting uh, material there. Uh, the 1954 um, image in E is actually a photograph. F is a drawing. Uh, I is a photograph. And L is a CCD image, just to show you the amount of detail. What's interesting here is that the apertures of the telescopes are uh, broadly similar, except that E and H are large professional instruments. The others are fairly similar uh, in aperture. You can see um, development of the markings over time. Uh, some of them also change their shape. If we compare B with K, for example, it's the same longitude of the planet, but you can see there are some some differences because of the development of the mysterious dark markings of the planet, which we'll say more about uh, shortly. Here's a very nice place uh, to observe where I've been before, a postcard from France from the Peak du Midi Observatory, high altitude observatory. I've not been there in the winter, but I have been there in the summer, and it is certainly a magnificent place in which to observe. And I'd like to share with you um, some photographs um, from my one and only visit there. And this was back in 1986. I had the opportunity to observe my old friend Jean Dragesco, the one meter Cassegrain telescope. And um, today's observers who use webcams often take something like 10,000 images and stack them together to get the best possible result. But the red image there, R at the top in the screen, is actually a single image and it's a photograph. And beneath it, there's one mark B, which is a blue filter photograph. And the one that's marked G in, in brackets is a synthetic green image by mer merging the two together. And the one marked RGB at the top left is the result of putting all three together, a synthetic color image. And that was very nice to have done at the time, back in 1986, before amateurs um, were let loose on CCD cameras. Uh, what I did. Uh, comparatively recently, was to scan the image into Registax program and to tweak it um, using the various um, settings that one can have. So the ones on the right are old photographs tweaked with Registax, and that really is quite an interesting thing to do with older astronomical photographs. There's a huge amount of stuff there out in the archives waiting to be um, to be scanned. Uh, very recently, I was able to make the first colour photographs of Jupiter uh, in the 1940s from images taken by uh, E.C. Slifer at the Lowell Observatory, Flagstaff, Arizona. And Slifer in his day um, would have had to have done all of this compositing work in the darkroom. Now, of course, it can be done on a laptop in a few minutes. What about these terms opposition, conjunction, and so on? Well, here we've got the orbit of Mars shown as uh, an ellipse, not, a, not the best diagram, I have to say. The Earth is shown, its orbit is not. When Sun, Earth, and Mars are in a straight line, we've got opposition, so the planet is closest to the Earth. And if the planet is on the other side of the orbit, we've got conjunction. Because the Martian orbit is elliptical, not all oppositions occur at the same distance from the Earth, and therefore the size of the planet will vary considerably between one opposition and the next. When the planet is near perihelion, in other words, its closest point to the sun, we get the biggest disk uh, that we can possibly see. And the biggest one of all time was in 2003. 2018 was almost as good. Um, and let's go on. And we have here um, illustration showing a series of modern CCD images. These were taken by Clyde Foster in South Africa. 2016 uh, and the years either side. And you can see that when the planet is first observed, it's really, really tiny. It comes towards us, we come through the period of opposition, it goes away again. We can also see the phase of the planet on the left at the top and on the right at the bottom. You can also see many changes on the surface, the polar caps, the atmosphere, uh, all sorts of interesting, uh, interesting effects there. But the main purpose of the slide is to show you what an awkward planet Mars is to observe, except for the month or two at opposition when it shows a large disk in the telescope. So it's a planet you have to be patient with. And if you want to observe it a long way from opposition, you're going to have to use um, 
fairly large instrument. One of the other things you can do is to make a map. Uh, when I made this map back in 1990, one had to do everything by hand, so there's a hand-drawn map from the best uh, images there. I'm also going to point out some Martian landmarks. So here are some Martian landmarks. If we look at longitude 270 to 300 at the bottom there, you can see you go up to the uh, south part of the image, see Halus. Halus is a large basin on the planet. It's a deep part, the, uh, the, the right-hand bottom part of Halus, as it were, is the deepest part uh, of the basin. And there, the Martian atmospheric pressure is a little bit higher than elsewhere. And it's this area which has caused a very large number of dust storms in the past. Just that little excess of atmospheric pressure does help. Um, other areas that uh, sometimes produce dust are Libya, to the left of Sirtis Major there, and Argyre, uh, the Chrysi area, which is near longitude 30, and, and also near Solus Lacus, which is near longitude uh, 90. So many interesting features there. The other area that produces uh, very interesting cloud formations is Tharsis, which is near longitude 90, which is where we've got some of the big uh, volcanoes of, of Mars over which clouds can form. So uh, there's a few uh, interesting points there. And of course, many of these dark markings have been stable over many centuries, but they also change so changes in their uh, shapes and intensities. One of the reasons they show uh, changes is because dust, fallout from dust storms, can fall over a dark marking, hiding it. Uh, sometimes uh, dust can be excavated from the surface, which causes uh, an underlying bedrock or uh, Martian feature to appear. So uh, these features are, are quite, uh, you can recognize the, the outlines, of course, but they are quite changeable when it comes to the fine detail. Let's have a look at some uh, regions of the planet. Um, this um, one here is taken around the longitude of Mari Acadalium and uh, shows some, some very well-known markings. The bottom row are some high quality uh, CCD images. You can also see the color of the planet uh, varies between images. Some people think it should be always red. Some people think it should always be yellow and they fiddle uh, with the color um, settings on their cameras to make it so. Uh, I always advise observers to uh, to leave it alone because the planet does change color and it's best not to interfere with that result. I'm mostly a visual observer, but I put in an image of mine just to show that I do occasionally take uh, images myself. So this sort of material is what we receive in the BAA and we try to put them into logical uh, reports and sequences. Uh, some observers are very good at making their own maps, which can be done quite easily by uh, computer these days. And uh, here's an example of one from 2010 by Damien Peach. Uh, one of the interesting things I said was watching the clouds over the giant volcanoes. Uh, here are some examples here. At the top, we've got the Tharsis Montes, um, Ascraeus, Arcea, Bonus Mons. And we've also got uh, a cloud over Olympus Mons. You can see the Olympus Mons cloud just left of the center of the disk on the January the 15th image by Olivetti, for example. And that is, of course, the biggest volcano in the solar system, a very remarkable object. I'm going to go on and show you how the cloud uh, varies during the course of the day. Here's a series of images taken by Damien Peach, March the 14th, um, 2012. And we can see um, Olympus Mons is the one that the feature that appears to go a little white tail behind it during the course of the day. And it's very much like the banner cloud. If you've ever been uh, to Zermatt and seen the Matterhorn on the Earth, you'll know what a banner cloud is. And this is the same sort of phenomenon on Mars. Very remarkable to see. And there's what it would look like if we're in orbit over it in a low flying spacecraft. Very remarkable object, which is the length of the whole chain of the Hawaiian Islands on its own. A little bit more about the orbit of Mars and the Earth, because one of the ways in which we uh, compare phenomena seen in different Martian years is in terms of the seasonal date. And um, this, uh, round the edge here, we've got some, at the bottom here, we've got 90 degrees, and this is 
uh, figure I'm talking about, we've also got 180 degrees here on the right, zero on the left, and at the top, 270. Now, this, um, this is called the areocentric longitude of Mars. And it's, as you see, like a giant protractor laid upon the Martian orbit. Now, the Martian seasons are defined in this way. When Mars is near longitude zero, that's the beginning of northern spring. When it's at 90, it's the beginning of northern summer. When it's 180, it's the beginning of southern spring. And at 270, southern summer. If we go around the edge of the protractor, some oppositions have been marked. The bottom left, 2010. Going round anti-clockwise, 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018, and right at the top, at about 11 o'clock, 2020. So 2020, we can see, is going to occur during the beginning of Southern Hemisphere summer. Uh, and 2018 was during mid-spring in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see nicely there that some oppositions are going to be close oppositions, uh, where they're closer to the Earth, uh, and some are going to be further away, like 2010, for example. So this value LS, or areocentric longitude, is quoted here, and we can see on some of these figures, I've indicated how different cloud formations change during the course of the Martian year. I won't go into detail. Another interesting thing that you can sometimes see on Mars uh, are projections beyond the Martian terminator. And on this um, drawing from 1903, Percival Lowell himself has drawn uh, an interesting cloud formation. This actually turns out to be a dust storm. And Lowell was able to track this cloud to measure its velocity and to measure by trigonometry its height. Here's a very remarkable cloud seen by amateurs in 2012 that was not observed by spacecraft. On the left-hand side, if you look at this big image of Mars by Don Parker in um, the left-hand figure, at about one o'clock on the morning terminator, there's something that appears to be sticking out of the atmosphere of Mars. And when this was measured, it was found to be of the order of 200 kilometers high. It's actually slightly beyond the atmosphere. Very remarkable feature. Um, I probably haven't got much time to go into details. This is the sort of thing the amateur can sometimes spot um, that might be missed by spacecraft. The other uh, drawings here show that similar phenomena have occurred in the past, although the two, uh, the middle and the right, were of lower altitude. Uh, here's the geometry here. Uh, so at the top, I've labeled projecting features. I've got a a cloud here which is in the dark at position one, position two it begins to catch the top the sunlight and position three it's coming into the, the sunlight. Now if you're able to make all of the measurements of the ang angles and sizes on this sort of diagram you can by trigonometry find out how high the Martian clouds are which is an interesting thing to do. Here are some more observations of those, those clouds. I say clouds, although we now believe that they probably were more of an auroral phenomenon because the actual longitude on the planet at which they happened was really very interesting. And the longitude at which these clouds occurred was the longitude at which there was a very strong magnetic anomaly. Here's a map of the crustal magnetism of Mars, and we probably know that the crustal magnetism of Mars is, is not um, simple like the Earth's field, but has a number of magnetic stripes. And I should say that this map has got north at the top and south at the bottom, but near 180 degrees, which is where these projections occurred, there is this very strong rate of change of the magnetic field. And we think uh, that these Martian aurorae um, occur in this area. And we think that what we saw in 2012 was just that, except it was imaged not by spacecraft, but by amateurs on the surface. There are all sorts of interesting other features that have been um, discovered over the years. If I draw your attention to the, the image at the bottom here on May the 1st, you will see that uh, we appear to have a cloud with a dark hole in it. And in fact, it's a circular cyclonic cloud. And the dark area is simply the surface of Mars seen in the middle of the cloud. And these clouds occur very regularly every Martian year. And it's interesting to time them 
and to watch them. The polar caps are also fascinating. Here's a series of images um, showing how the polar cap uh, gradually dwindles in size. Remember, of course, that the surface pressure on Mars is too low to, uh, to allow uh, water to melt, but water does uh, sublime. And as the polar cap evaporates, we get rifts occurring, outlying bright patches. And one thing that's very interesting to do with amateur images these days, because they're now of uh, good enough quality, is to measure them for the size or diameter of the cap. And um, here we're, we're measuring uh, latitude and uh, the north or the south pole, we've got latitude 90. And here we've got circles of latitude here, parallels of latitude going from um, 80, 70, 60, 50 down towards the equator. And if you have a number of images, you can measure the latitude of the cap of Mars and you can measure how that changes with time. So at the beginning of spring, we've got a large spring cap near latitude 50. This is the North Polar Cap for 2012. Latitude 50, it starts off, and uh, when it's fully sublimed, it's gone down uh, beyond latitude 80. And what we're doing here is to compare Martian years. And there are some small changes with time. Uh, and that's a very interesting subject in itself, which I'll return to uh, briefly uh, later on. So these are the Martian seasons again. Uh, spring and summer in the uh, southern hemisphere are particularly interesting to observers of dust storms. The reason for that is that, that is the season when they occur. And uh, this uh, study here, what I've gone uh, here, I've, I've gone back through all of the archives and looked at the telescopic Martian dust storms right from the year dot up to date. The earliest um, example of one I ever found uh, was for 1704. That will be a story in itself. The earliest global dust storm when all of the features were hidden was 1877. This wasn't actually discovered until 2009 in some archives in Paris, a discovery made by uh, William Sheehan in the United States and myself who were there for a conference. and looked through a notebook of Etienne Trouvelot's from 1877 and discovered that he had seen a global dust storm. Um, this particular study published in BAA uh, memoir in 1999, which was the result of many years of work. Um, and basically these rectangular boxes show that part of the Martian year, which was uh, covered by dust storms. You can see some years, there's an observational record, but there are no global storms. Some years have them, some years don't. It's an ongoing mystery we'd like to solve. And here's the whole picture now from 1877 up to 2018 for you to study at your leisure. And uh, these are the areas where uh, major dust storms begin. Uh, they change over time. Um, just to show how dangerous it is to write anything in a book, um, uh, Slifer of the Lowell Observatory published a famous book in 1964 where he said that the area to the left of Certis Major, Libya, was the area where there were the most dust storms. Uh, as soon as he published that book, the area stopped being active and uh, dust storms were seen elsewhere, but not that area again but for many years. And one of the reasons for that must be that dust, dust, uh, what goes up must come down. So the dust that's been raised in, say, Hallas must be deposited somewhere else. And what's very interesting is that over the last four decades, maybe five decades, there seems to have been a net fallout of dust in the northern hemisphere. Some of the features that we can see on this chart are much less um, obvious today. Near longitude 200, for example, there's a feature called Trivium Charontis. That is virtually invisible uh, these days because it's been hidden by dust. And one could say the same for a number of other features. So that's an interesting characteristic in itself. Uh, here's the book here. I, I don't have um, I don't have um, a remedy for COVID nineteen, but I do have a rem a, a remedy for insomnia. If you get this book of mine, I can guarantee that you will never suffer from insomnia ever um, again. But going back to that chart, uh, these regions where we see dust storms are very interesting, and they do change with time. And I'd like to give you a few uh, telescopic examples of these fascinating events. We'll have a look at 2018, that's the most recent example. And the original storm 
uh, was most interesting because it began not in the southern, southern hemisphere, which all of the previous ones have done, but in the northern hemisphere of Mars. Remember what I said about dust fallout being mostly in the northern hemisphere? Well, uh, maybe you reach a point where there's so much dust, um, you get a dust storm produced. And there it is, uh, May the 30, 31st. Uh, it's on the second day of the storm, that image from the USA. It's also well observed in the uh, UK by some observers, but we can see fairly quickly the features of the planet vanishing under this lemon yellow canopy of dust. And I'm just going to go quickly through some other lovely images um, to show you uh, some sequences of, of the movements of those dust storms. I won't say much detail about them, I'll just show the, the pictures themselves. Here's a historical uh, picture taken by uh, E.C. Slifer. And I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, top right picture taken in 1956. And there's an extremely dark area near the South Pole. And um, at some point, some astronomers thought that these yellow clouds are water vapor and that they were actually um, depositing water on the Martian vegetation, which then responded to being watered and darkened. We now know that these dark areas adjacent to yellow clouds or dust storms are because the dust has been removed from the surface, lowering the albedo of the surface in that, in that region. So that's very interesting historically. Uh, here's a couple of images showing um, a storm developing. We can see a storm, a yellow cloud, it's in black and white, unfortunately, to the right of Sobus Lacus there. There's the dust arrowed in this slide. If I go on one more, a few days later, a new dark area has appeared where that dust cloud had been. So this is surface um, being uncovered by, by dust, the albedo being lowered. We go on, and of course, the dust eventually settled. Um, here's some old photographs. You might wonder what um, dust looks like from the Martian surface. And these are images taken by opportunity of an earlier dust storm showing how the sky becomes really very dark. And of course, for the rovers, this is a bit critical because, of course, the solar panels will only work uh, for a limited period of time. Uh, here's a nice picture of dust devil on the surface. This is how the storms um, grow and amalgamate by dust devils coming together. And I think there's an animation on the next slide uh, which isn't going to work on this particular monitor, unfortunately. Will go on. And this is just a graph showing how the opacity of the atmosphere, which they call tau values here, uh, changes uh, with time during a Martian dust storm. The other thing, of course, once the planet emerged from the dust, we began to see all of the usual surface uh, and seasonal phenomena again. If you look at the south polar cap here, you can see it's beginning to shrink and fragment. Uh, here, you can see a little fragment, a little detached fragment coming off the polar cap here. And this is these called the Mountains of Mitchell. It's not actually a mountain, it's actually a depression. It was discovered by an American Civil War um, general. Of course, the Civil War having been in the news recently for all the wrong reasons. Um, and uh, th this particular little de detached point here uh, was discovered by General Ormsby McKnight Mitchell from Cincinnati in 1845 uh, using a rather nice uh, telescope. As I say, he was a military uh, man. And uh, this little point is a very useful seasonal marker because it doesn't always occur at the, um, at, at the exact uh, same seasonal moment. It does uh, have some slight uh, changes uh, from year to year. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, 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 the polar cap evaporates a little bit more slowly or a little bit more quickly than others. And therefore, the time at which the Mitchell Mountain gets left behind by the general retreat of the cap can be used as a seasonal indicator. Uh, of course, modern technology can do a lot. And this is a result of an amateur using um, a remote telescope, chiliscope in this case. This is work by Damien Peach, and I know I've got it upside down if Damien's watching, because I like south at the top. But the detail shown uh, with this professional telescope in just the right place is quite extraordinary. And those of you who saw the earlier uh, map 
that the position of Caprates or the Martian Grand Canyon will be able to see that that region is a bright streak filled with dust. Uh, what about 2020? That's the next opposition. Well, we might have our own problems with COVID-19 at the moment, but the most historically similar opposition turns out to be 1941. And this observer, Hargreaves, uh, observed from Kingswood in Surrey um, and had a lot of trouble with um, air raids. Uh, so the enemy, instead of being all around him, uh, was, was overhead, uh, perhaps um, more detectable and easier to deal with than, than, than COVID, but certainly observed under very trying circumstances. But lovely drawings made by one of the best, of, uh, best known planetary artists with a 14 inch reflector that he had made um, himself and polished the mirror himself as he was an optician. So beautiful drawings there showing the features that were observed in 1941. It's also a hint of a cloud over Olympus Mons in the drawing bottom middle towards the evening side and features that we would recognize today. Let's have a look at some of the early uh, images from the opposition. Here are some images taken by Neil McNeil in Australia. Uh, at the moment, the, the planet has been south of the celestial equator, has been low from the UK. And here are some observations here showing some obscuration of the Mariner Valley by dust and some albedo changes on the surface. So that's quite interesting. Um, this is a, a map showing some of the, uh, the darker and brighter areas in the South Polar Cap. And these are features that can be observed every every year. And this, this is a famous map drawn by Antoniadi from his own observations from the perihelic opposition 1924, which was the closest opposition of the 20th century. We've also got some lovely images here by Clyde Foster, South Africa. Here we can see some evening clouds here over the Tharsis Montes, three great peaks of the volcano showing uh, clouds on the evening side. We've also got a very dark patch appearing in the centre of the polar cap. Uh, we know from spacecraft observations that one of these uh, dark patches in the centre of the cap may be caused by uh, the sun uh, warming up um, the cap and causing some sand or some dust fountaining uh, from the centre of the cap, which then falls back to create a low albedo area. And that uh, is a really interesting feature for amateurs to watch and to image. Uh, and we've got some lovely uh, images taken with remote telescopes. Here's one um, from Chile Scope by Damien Peach. And this shows the South Polar Cap breaking up an enormous amount of detail, even though the disk is only 10.2 arc seconds in diameter. When Mars comes to opposition, it will be just more than 22 arc second. So I can imagine the sort of results that he's going to get, but I also hope uh, that you will also get um, some excellent views of Mars uh, at opposition in 2020. Uh, if you miss this one, you'll have to wait quite a long time. The perihelic oppositions come along every 15 or 17 years, so you really will have to wait uh, for the next one. So make the most of this one. 2022 is also going to be good but 2020 will be the best for British observers of this particular cycle. Um, and just to, to spell out why Mars is it's interesting to Earth-based observers, there are other planets apart from Mars. I'm sure you knew that. But remember that Mars is the only planet where changes upon the surface can be observed directly by us. We can see changes in the atmosphere of Jupiter and Saturn, but we can't see changes upon their surface. And again, if you want to get this um, uh, Telescopic Martian Dust Storms book, if I was speaking to you in a room, I would probably have a pile of them uh, sale. But unfortunately, I can't do my uh, sales campaign uh, uh, with the society today. Uh, but if you want to obtain one, you can get it through the British Astronomical Association. And as I say, it won't cure COVID-19, but it is guaranteed to cure insomnia. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for a really informative and enthralling talk. Um, I think for all of those as well as with uh, telescopes, that's really wet, whetted the appetite for this coming apparition, which I've got in my calendar, 13th of October, the opposition of, of Mars to try and get some good images and I hope all our members can, can do that. So um, we're going to take questions uh, in a moment, uh, Richard. So we're using our Google uh, YouTube live chat function. So there's a 30 second delay on this. So we'll just have to work with that. Um, so please do submit your questions now to Richard and we'll uh, take 10, 15 minutes of, of questions if Richard's okay uh, with that. So our first question, um, you mentioned the very start of your talk, uh, an old friend of uh, yours, who actually a member of our society, Alan Heath. Um, and we thought it'd be quite nice if he asked a question for you tonight. Unfortunately, he doesn't have YouTube. We've actually been sending him copies of all these uh, meetings on DVD. But uh, we did speak to him earlier um, to ask a question. So if the technology works, I'm going to play that to you now, if you're able to answer that one. Um, let's just see if we get this to work. I, I, I was looking in De Vaucouleur's, um book uh, about Mars, and yeah. he talks about a violet layer, uh, but there, there hasn't been much said about it. But the thing is, when you look at the at, uh, Mars with a uh, with, with a, a deepish blue filter, such as Raton Forty Seven, um, all the surface features are you just don't see. It's virtually a blank disk. Mm -hmm. You know, you can probably see the. Um, uh, the pole cap or something of that sort, but uh, just occasionally uh, you can see all the um, uh, surface features, and this and this is known as a blue clearing. But I'm not sure of, uh, if any, you know, recent information has come up about it or, as to why it occurs and so forth, and, okay. and the, co the course. Uh, so whether Richard knows about that, I don't know. But I mean, that would be my question to him. You know. Uh, is um, is there any any uh, more recent information about blue clearing? So there we go, uh, Richard. Any thoughts uh, and updates on blue clearing? Well, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Alan, for your question. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, I, I will refer um, listeners to a, a slide that was shown earlier in the talk. There was a. Uh, a slide of Percival Lowell, and it's the one immediately before that, which is called the Equatorial Cloud Band 2009 to 2010. And if people perhaps have a look at the video again and have a look at that slide, I'll, I'll make a few remarks about it. Um, the, the blue clearing is a historical um, conundrum that was around for about 70 years, in fact, and Alan has described um, what it is. And the phenomenon is related to this feature called the equatorial cloud band, which is around from LS0 till about LS150. It's a band of white cloud along the planet's equator. And if um, it's fairly thick, uh, features that are normally crossing the equator, such as the famous Certus Major, are absolutely blotted out by it and impossible uh, to see. Now, it used to be thought that there was a so-called violet layer in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, all attempts to find it failed. Spacecraft haven't seen it. And we now know the violet layer doesn't exist. Um, we now believe that it's the somewhat unusual scattering properties of the planet's surface that are responsible for the so-called blue clearing. When the planet is exactly at opposition, um, features at blue wavelengths are much more sharply defined than away from opposition but it's actually a surface phenomenon and not um, an atmospheric phenomenon. Although, um, if, as I say, the equatorial cloud belt happens to be visible, uh, this will tend um, to put a damper on the features that you can see. And a good example of that, if you look at the February the 3rd image on the slide I mentioned, very close to opposition, you'll see how nicely visible the features are in violet light. So um, not a feature of the atmosphere in the end, a feature of the surface, something quite unexpected, but the end to a historical mystery. Cool, thank you for that. We'll make sure Alan gets a copy of the DVD and can and hear the answer to that. That's great, thank you. 
Um, a question from me then, and I guess this is pertinent to um, all of us in the society who are observers and imagers. Um, you mentioned quite a lot a bit about the origins of the global dust storms um, on Mars. Obviously, uh, in 2018, we were subject to one which prevented us seeing much surface detail uh, for the last approach. So um, what are the prospects for uh, this autumn apparition of the planet? Uh, and what the prospects of the dust storms or getting a global dust storm and what can we learn um, from some of those patterns that you were showing of the historical records of dust storms on Mars? Okay well Richard I wonder if you're a betting man I wonder if you would bet on the Grand National if you had 30% chance of winning how would you react to that? It doesn't sound good. <laughs> and, it and doesn't no, sound good. Knowing our look with astronomical events and <laughs> no it, it doesn't it doesn't sound good so I'm going to tell you that the chance of getting um, a Martian dust storm is roughly um, 30%. Uh, so if we add up all of the Martian years that we've observed, roughly one in three uh, does produce a global dust storm. What's very interesting is that some decades are much more dustier than others. The 1970s, 1971, 73, 75, 77, um, all produce global storms, but there was very little in, in, in several decades. So uh, if we go to the most recent ones, 2001, 2007, and 2018. So these, these are the statistics. Um, we believe, as I think I said in the talk, that there, there are probably patterns to these over the years. We don't quite understand the full details, but it seems that dust does settle preferentially in certain areas. And perhaps for a few years after that, those areas are clearing the dust and producing storms. But these might just be local events. So an actual planetary scale source does require quite specific locations. Some very recent research that I've been involved with, and people can Google this on the internet, it's possible to find the paper. It's a paper just published in Journal Geophysical Research by Jim Shirley from NASA JPL and myself and two other authors in which we consider um, a quantity called angular momentum. And we show that if you do um, calculations with a suitable computer on the angular momentum of the solar system, it seems to have an influence on the Martian dust storms. And we've gone back and shown that there are correlations between this quantity, especially its rate of change, and um, the occurrence of global storms in many past years of Mars. To cut a long story short, we made predictions for the next four years. Uh, I don't know whether they'll come true. I wish I could bet on the Grand National, have some success. I never have um, any success with that. And normally when I say there's going to be a Martian dust storm, uh, there isn't. But I'm going to say, and you heard it here, um, live at the Nottingham Astronomical Society, that we predict that there won't be a global dust storm in 2018. Um, or indeed in the next couple of years. Um, and after that, um, like weather reports, I think we'd want um, more data. It's an interesting um, uh, theory anyway, and uh, I can't perhaps go into detail now, but I will stick my neck out and say, I think there isn't going to be one this year. But as I said before, I'm not gonna put any money on it whatsoever. Thank you. We've got you on record saying we can get some superb images and views of Mars this time around then. <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> okay, let's go to a couple of the uh, questions we've had from members on the live chat. I've put them on the screen. I'll read them out to you if you can't see them. Um, so we've got one from Mike on here saying, if you're on the surface of Mars, what would the ferocity of a dust storm be in comparison with the Saharan event, for example, on the Earth? Yes. Um, in terms of what you would feel, I'm not sure if you'd notice very much. We have had winds in excess of 100 kilometres per hour on Mars in association with the big storm in 2018. However, the atmospheric pressure is uh, about 100 times lower. So uh, you're really not going to notice um, that very much if you were standing there. Um, some of you will have seen science fiction films in which Martian dust storms topple spacecraft and buildings, but I'm afraid they're not like that. The surface pressure um, is just too low. What you would notice though, as an astronaut, would be incredibly fine dust, which is going to stick to your space suit 
which is certainly going to get into your nostrils, uh, even in the best um, possible airlock. And that's going to be a real problem in the future if we ever get to Mars. OK, another question from James. And so uh, dust storms are most annoying for us amateurs, uh, but what information can planetary scientists glean from them? Well, one of the interesting things you can do is to time how long the storm lasts. In other words, how long it is um, taking the dust to fall out of the Martian atmosphere and what mechanisms there are for that. Um, the particles are about a micron in size, and this is consistent with um, several weeks spent in suspension in the atmosphere. We also believe it's possible for them to stick um, to particles of water ice, which will hasten their uh, their settling out. So I think one of the very interesting things is 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 the the way in which the the dust settles, um, and that's been studied uh, certainly by professionals for very many years, going back to the Mariner spacecraft and 1971 where spacecraft arrived in orbit just as a Martian storm was starting. It's also very interesting to look at images um, that even the giant volcanoes, uh, which as you know, 27 odd kilometers high, disappear during a Martian dust storm. And as the dust settles, these gradually become visible. So it's possible to actually measure the height of the Martian um, uh, dust going down by reference to a geological map the planet so many interesting things you can do with that okay one from uh, roy um can you summarize uh, any recommendations of what filters are worth uh, trying to use for your scope on mars i guess is there a difference yes. between filters for uh, visual as well as um trying to image them? yes um well uh, there's a lot of um nonsense which has been written about filters um if you want to see the surface features better um, you need a yellow, orange, or a red filter. It doesn't particularly matter which one. You just need to have something that um, will not make the image um, too dim. If you want the white clouds to stand out, you need a blue or a violet filter, preferably a violet one, although you may find you need a decent aperture telescope um, to support the rather dim image that you get. So the, the, the main thing is long wavelength filter, red, orange, or yellow, for the surface features and blue or violet features for uh, the clouds. If you're going to do tricolor imaging, you need to have a, stand, a rather standard red filter, preferably a glass one, a green one, and um, a blue one. The, the rattan ones, which, are, uh, which used to be available in photographic shops, but now which um, can be bought from uh, places, uh, telescope uh, suppliers, I better not ne name any, uh, Rattan 25 is a very good red one, Rattan 58 is a very good green one, Rattan 47 is a very good blue one, and those are, are very good, but there are many others on the market. Okay, uh, a question from Tony. Um, is the Martian dust now fairly homogenous across the entire surface of the planet? Um, it's certainly present all over the planet, um, but uh, the the, the features, if you like, rapidly um, shake themselves clean of the dust. So if it falls on some small rocks, little local winds will tend to blow it off again. Um, if um, it was homogeneous over the surface of the planet, all of the albedo features, some of which are topographic and some of which um, don't really have much height contrast, would all disappear and remain invisible. But um, with, with storms, we had quite a, uh, a big regional storm in the last couple of weeks. It didn't reach global proportions, but it was quite a big regional storm. The, the features returned um, to a sort of normality quite quickly. So the dust settles, but um, although it hides features when it settles, it's soon um, blown away into gullies, rifts, and that sort of thing. So if Mars were a perfectly flat planet, I think we would see a uniform distribution, but because there are big topographic contrasts like the Ballas Marineris, like the Hellas Basin, like deep craters, like gullies and ravines, we do see um, the, the normal features coming back. Okay, um, another question from Fred. Uh, how often does the Martian axis of spin change? Uh, that's a very long-term <laughs> question. Um, yeah. I think 
Um, this, uh, I've got the figure in my book, but I haven't got the book next to me on the table. I think it's of the order of 20 to 30,000 years, Fred. Um, I, I think you can probably find the answer to that. But, but I, it's an interesting question with regard to um, dust storms, because um, th this will mean that the, the, the sort of band of latitudes over which they occurred historically uh, may well have changed with time. Unfortunately, our own database of Martian dust storms goes back only to the beginning of the 18th century, so we don't have um, a chance of seeing any shift um, uh, in, our, in our own um, sort of human uh, domain. But I think it's of the order of 20, 30,000 years, that sort of figure. Okay, um, I was looking at a geology map of Mars, and there seems to be quite a big difference between the, sort of the, the topography of the planet in the one hemisphere to the other. Does that have any effect in terms of driving those, the, the, most of the dust storms originating from the southern part of the planet? What, what we find with, with the dust storms um, in, in the southern hemisphere, which is, 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 is fairly highly cratered, we do find some elevated areas. And um, what, what tends to, to be a good driving force for the dust storm is, is a height contrast, because that gives a pressure gradient and it's these pressure gradients which are going to drive the Martian winds. So um, I think we find more of those topographic contrasts in the Southern Hemisphere, um, basins such as Hellas and Argaia, um, the, the Valles Marineris and so on, at one side of the Certus Major compared to the other. These are sort of strong topographic contrasts in the Northern Hemisphere, or although we've got features such as Olympus Mons, um, You've also got to have the appropriate dust um, reservoir, uh, such as a basin, such as some sort of contained area for them to start. So it's an uh, excellent question, but it seems that um, historically most of the storms mm -hmm. have begun in the south. Of course, having said that, 2018 began in the north. I guess I as Mars section director, you probably get this, asked question, this question asked more than in any other. Um, I'm surprised it's taken this long for it to come up, but do you think there's ever been uh, life of any description on Mars? Ah, well, is there any life there now? This is the question. Um, I'd like to think so. We have definite evidence, um, if we look at Gale Crater, for example, that there are stratified deposits. This can only have happened if there was a lot of water, standing body of water for a geologically long time. So uh, there was certainly water there. Uh, there would certainly have been a thicker atmosphere. There would certainly have been a slightly warmer climate. So um, the chemical conditions there were, were, were ripe. We might, um, there might possibly have been life. Um, I'm a skeptic about Martian methane. Um, I've, I've written about this in several places in the BAA journal. I won't go into detail here, but um, many of the reported detections of it are due to instrumental error, uh, that it is a controversial subject and probably I can't give a one minute answer to it. I would like to think though, that there might be pockets of um, microbial life hidden deep inside the planet, perhaps associated with some geologically active feature. Uh, so that's my view. Uh, unfortunately, there are no um, large scale Martians and um, certainly, um, certainly no uh, no large Martian plants, but I'm, I'm not against the idea of microbial life, even now. I think I once read somewhere that NASA never send any probes on their robotic missions to actually detect signs of life in order to look for the indicators of life. I don't know whether that, that was, is true or not. Well, I think they got their fingers slightly burned back in, at the time of the Viking mission, and I remember being a school schoolboy at the time, and I remember being very excited with the six o'clock news, as it was then, that they announced life on Mars. They'd basically shaken some Martian dust with some uh, basically chicken soup, and w waited for the Martian organisms to so basically belch and produce some gases. And they detected those gases, and they announced that there was life on Mars. And a few days later, they retracted it, saying, "No, it's the unusual." surface chemistry. So I think they got their fingers slightly burnt. So what they now do, and I believe um, they've now discovered and announced um, the 
uh, the, the, the presence of water on Mars at least eight times now. So they follow the water. That's the story. Um, <laughs> they follow the water. And if there's water, there might be life. But if they keep on discovering water, there will certainly be more funding. And I think there's just a follow up there from Tony about his question on how homogenous across the surface um, the dust now is. He said he wasn't clear. He was asking about the geological makeup of the dust and whether oh. the size of the storms means that is now an even mix. Um, I think I think that's probably true. Um, although the, the, the particles that get lofted are one micron, there are lots of other particles. There are there are finer particles and uh, bigger particles. It turns out that the optimum size to be raised in the atmosphere is about a micron. The, 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 the process of sedimentation where large grains bounce across the surface, throwing the smaller ones into the atmosphere. Um, the, the one micron grains are the, the preferred size. But as I say, there are finer and there are um, there are bigger ones. And I would imagine you're right. I would imagine that it is pretty uniformly distributed across the surface. Of course, it's it's all it, it's being modified with time because there are impacts um, on the, the pass, uh, small uh, meteoritic impacts all the time on the surface, um, changing, perhaps locally changing composition a bit, but the fallout from the storms is certainly homogenizing the dust over a long period of time. Great, thank you, Richard. Uh, I think that is all the questions we've got through now. We've been going 20 minutes or so with questions, so we'll leave it there. Um, just remains for me to say thank you very much for providing this evening's talk and, and coming on to answer questions. Um, it's been an excellent talk. We've had one of our highest view counts uh, in the live meeting to date. So uh, a huge thank you from everyone at Nottingham Astronomical Society for giving it your time to uh, prepare and deliver this evening's talk. It's been brilliant. It was a great pleasure coming to Nottingham this evening and certainly the easiest trip to Nottingham that I've ever had in my life. Thank you for inviting me, Richard, and also James. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, just uh, Richard referenced this in his uh, talk. So if you go to the BA website, so that's britastro.org, you can see uh, his tutorial here on drawing the planets and some tips on, on how to do that. So do check that out uh, on the BA website. If you go to the homepage, I think the link links up there on the homepage, you go straight to it. And we certainly have a great opportunity to, to do imaging and particularly get involved in some sketching of the planet uh, this coming autumn. So, so do you give that a go? Okay, we thought we'd end uh, this evening's meeting uh, by showing some uh, images that members have taken of the planet Mars through their telescopes. It was quite interesting actually going through them. Um, we've had images, I think, taken over the last uh, 15 years or so. So I've just put them into a, a quick uh, uh, file now just to play those through. Uh, they actually start in uh, date order, chronological order, uh, I think beginning in about 2005. So we'll just uh, have a quick look at those before we finish tonight.
So thank you to all members who sent in uh, images uh, for us to display this evening. Apologies for showing the one at the end, that was from Damien Peach, but I thought it was nice to see an example of real top-notch amateur um, images of, of Mars, and we saw a few of his images in this evening's talk. So thanks again, everyone, for submitting your images. Just a quick reminder before we finish um, of our upcoming live meeting in a fortnight's time, and that is on Thursday, the 16th of July at 8 p.m. And we have one of our former presidents of the society, Alan Heath, and he's going to talk about his lifetime of astronomical observation. So do make sure you join us for that. Uh, and also after this meeting, Julian is having a members Zoom meeting. So you can all log into that. I think you should, members should have been sent the details to log into that. Uh, and they're also available at the start of the live chat. So do please uh, log into that uh, in a couple of minutes time and, and join Julian. So thank you very much for watching this evening, everybody. Um, my thanks to Richard McKim from the BA for delivering tonight's excellent talk. And we'll hopefully see you in a fortnight's time for our meeting with Alan Heath. Thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Good night.